Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's an amazing, amazing, wonderful day outside. If you get a chance, you should really go and spend some time outside in nature. But right now, you're here in the house of the Lord to hear the message of the Lord. Now, before I, before I begin, before we begin with prayer, I want to ask you a question. If, if somebody came to you and said, sell everything you're, you own and come follow me, you would look at them and say, that's a ridiculous request, my brother. I'm sorry, I cannot do that. But yet, Jesus does this to a man who was rich. Still a ridiculous request. But now, if somebody asked you, now here's the thing, it's possible for you to sell all your things and come follow him, right? But now imagine somebody came to you and said, hey, command these stones and turn them into bread. That's a ridiculous request because you are incapable of doing such a thing. None of us can do that. This, today, this sermon is entitled, The Ridiculous Request. Please bow your head with me. Dear kind and merciful Father, Lord, I am a man born in sinful flesh, and I'm unworthy to even be here and speak. But because of your blood, because of your sacrifice, I'm here. Please speak to them through your word, for you have said in your word, I am but grass here today, gone tomorrow, but your word is eternal and it is forever. So I pray that your word be glorified and I decrease. In your name I pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me just find the clicker. Now, I wasn't always an Adventist, for I wasn't really religious at all. Um, one might consider that I, I was atheist or just multi-religion because I believed in any God. But God drew me to himself, and I fell in love with him, and I said, okay, I need to know more about you. I'm 17 years old at this time, and I don't know anything about you, but all the youth in the church, they know about you. So I said, okay, let me just read the Bible then. Now, I started with the Beatitudes, and I love the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that are, that, are, that are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, so they shall receive mercy. And I said, yes, I agree with this. This is awesome. But then I came to a passage that when I read it, I said, Lord, I do not agree. It says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Wow. Jesus, that's a ridiculous request. Now, someone said to me, okay, Michael, no, you're, you have to understand the principle, though. It's, it means don't retaliate. But... I'm sorry, it means more than that. Because if someone slaps me in my face, right? Not retaliating is basically I just walk away and I don't, you know, I just leave them alone. But if somebody slaps me in my face, according to the verse, turn and offer them your other cheek also. So it's like this. Slap me and I offer you. I'm encouraging you to continue. Am I not? So, that's ridiculous. Nobody would want to, why would you encourage someone to keep doing it? But you know, Jesus is our Savior. And the Jews knew this rule. They knew this rule. Oh, before I go there. They knew this rule. They knew the rule of eye for an eye. Right? They were told this by Moses, in the law of Moses. But... When it came to their time, instead of, now, just to start off, the reason why that law was implemented in the first place was because of tribal warfare. They were at, there were tribes at that time. And here's the thing, they were really cold. If you killed one member in their tribe, they didn't just punish the person that did it. They went after your whole tribe and wiped them out. So to 
turn this down a little bit, turn this down a notch, and make it right, they said, okay, the person that did it is the one that gets punished, eye for an eye. But now, in Jesus' time, this, they had changed the law a little bit. Instead of, you know, um, mutilation, if, you, you know, if I take out your eye, you take out mine, instead of that, they said, okay, financial compensation. So, if I did something wrong to you, especially slapping someone in their face, I could, you could take me to court and sue me and I would have to pay you money in return. And the reason why this was, they, they lived in a shame and honor society. If you had honor, you got into the best schools, you got the best job, you were recognized in society. Your community acknowledged you. But if you had shame on your name, nobody acknowledged you. You got nothing. You had to go somewhere else where people didn't know you and hopefully start over there without getting any shame on your name and hope no one comes and tells them, hey, this guy is shameful. So now, wait, Jesus, are you saying, in the principle, if I apply this, are you saying if somebody does something wrong to me, I should not seek financial compensation for it? Whoa, whoa, make sense of this, Lord, because you're a reasonable God. Right? We agree. He's reasonable. Let's see what it says in the next verse. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your cloak also. Hmm. So he's still dealing in this courtroom situation here. Now, this law, is that, this, this instance, he's using something in referring to a law that they had. And, it, and it's in Exodus 22, verse 26 to 27. It says, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before sun sets, for that is his only covering. It is his cloak of for his body. What else shall he sleep in? So just to give you an example, you see the shirt, and there's a cloak. Now, in their society, as the scripture says, they needed the poor especially. Everybody had one, but the poor especially needs it because it's his only covering and he sleeps on the street. He has no home. So that's what keeps him warm. But according to the verse, if somebody sues you, if somebody sued a poor man, that poor man is to take, they to sue him for a shirt. He takes his shirt and he's to give his cloak also. You know what's in that? He's to give it also. So now he has nothing. Jesus, that's a ridiculous request. That's not logical. Nobody's going to do that. But you know, he's wisdom. He gives wisdom. So maybe he's going to make more sense as he goes on. He says, now, whosoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Now, interestingly enough, he's actually referring to a law here. Now, in this instance, this is Mount's, um, wow, how can I forget this? He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews on the mountain here. And the Jews hated the Romans. But this is a Roman law that Jesus is referring to. They hated the Romans so much that they wanted them gone. They wanted to separate. That's why they were looking for the Messiah, to separate them from the from their Romans forever. In fact, to destroy them. But now the Romans, well, while they were there in Jerusalem, while they had them captive, they had a law. If a military soldier, a soldier, went, wanted to carry, had a lot of load, and he wanted to carry his, his belongings, but he couldn't, he could take somebody who was not a Roman citizen and force them to carry his armor or his load one mile. And they had to do it of punishment of death or shame. So, you being a Jew, hear that your Messiah says, obey the law of the people that you hate. I'm sorry, Jesus, that's a ridiculous request. No person is going to do that. Not even that. Notice what he does. He says, go with them two miles. You're only required to go one. But he said, go two now, I'm going to be honest, 
if my wife and I, my wife asked me, honey, can you carry this for me one mile? I would say, yes, baby, I'll carry it for you one mile, and I'll be willing to carry it for her two miles because I love her. But now if she forced me, as the verse verse, forced me now, I would carry it two miles, but I'll be very reluctant. Now, this is referring to an enemy, not a loved one. So if an enemy forces you to do something for them, Jesus is saying, do it for them and go beyond. Wow. I'm sorry, Lord. That's ridiculous. But he's our God. He knows better. He knows best. And he makes sense. Right? So let's see if he's going to make sense now. Now he says, give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Okay, where are you going with this, Lord? It was then that I was, I was pondering this. I noticed there were, they had some common threads in each experience. In the first one, there was give. You gave them, you gave them your cheek. You gave them your cloak. And give to whoever asks of you. You gave them an extra mile. There's that common thread in each example. But there's another. Each one was an enemy. It's an enemy that slaps you. When somebody slaps you in your face, they become your enemy in that moment. When somebody takes you to court, they're your enemy in court. And the Romans were considered the enemies of the Jews. So give enemy. So I said, hey, this is, okay, what, what are you talking about here, Lord? Make more sense, please. It was then, and I read the next verse. And for the first time, I never saw the connection. I never saw the connection, but for the first time, I did. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It was then that I saw the third thread. If you, somebody slaps you in your face and you offer them, you're giving them, you're, you're, you're showing love to them. If somebody sues you and you give them more than what is required of you, that's an act of love. If your enemy forces you to go away and you go an extra mile for them, that's an act of love. So Jesus, through each example, he's saying, give enemy love. Now, did he do that himself? The first example, what did he give? If anybody slaps you in your face, in the judgment hall, as the picture is depicted, they slapped him in his face. Do you remember him cursing them? Do you remember him saying a thing about them? Not one thing, not one word, right? A lamb laid to the slaughter. But what did he do, though? He went the extra mile for them. Because he died for the very ones that were hitting him. They were his enemies, and they spat in his face. Now notice this. Remember, it's a shame and honor, right? If they slap you, they shame you. But what has he done? He has died. They have shamed him for calling himself the Son of God. And in him doing this, he died for them, for them to be called the sons and daughters of God. He fulfills the first example. Now notice this. He says, then he said, Jesus, forgive them for they know not what they do. So he prayed for them when they did the very evil acts to him. So now here we finally see him speak in regards to them. Remember, remember you, you all said it. He did not curse or said anything bad about them. But on the cross, where they did the most heinous act to an innocent man, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He wasn't practicing a script. He meant this. This was sincere. Remember the example of someone takes your cloak? When we know from the story, when they took Jesus' tunic, they took his cloak, 
and they, and they said, you know what, let's cast lots for it. Now, those are Romans, right? Those are the enemies of the Jews. Who's the ones that put him on the cross? Who nailed him? The Romans, right? The Jews set it up for the Romans to take them, take him. But these are the guys that nailed him. And yet, so they take his cloak, and what does he do in return? He gives them his righteousness. It was a Roman that said, this is the son of God. And what did he get in return? He gets his robe of righteousness. So you take Jesus' cloak and Jesus gives you his robe of righteousness. He follows the second, the second example. But let's see where he goes now. Now this is an interesting, interesting story. This is actually, in the Bible, we see that Roman law actually activated. When Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry Jesus' cross, it was by a Roman guard. They took him aside and said, hey, he can't carry his cross, so you carry it. Simon can help Jesus carry his cross one mile up the hill, as was requested. But Jesus, Simon didn't realize Jesus is carrying his cross. Not just his cross, the whole world's cross. But how did Jesus do it? He went the extra mile. He took it all the way into eternity that right now, as he is interceding on our behalf, we are able to confess our sins and have eternal life. And we don't have to die that death. Because he took it the extra mile. So the third example is still applied. It's still applied. So what's the ridiculous request? Jesus is saying, be like me. That's as plain as he's saying it. Be like me. Now, we've seen the son do it, right? We've seen Jesus do it. He gives his enemy love, right? We've seen that step, that thread. And we saw how he asked us to do it. And, you know, we all, when we read it, it sounds ridiculous. But does the Father do it? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Who was the world? What does the Bible say? The world is the, the enemy of God. What did he do, though, to his enemy? He gave his only begotten. Now, the word begotten in our King James Bibles is actually translated incorrectly. It doesn't mean begotten. It means one of a kind. Now understand, this, this, this actually makes it begotten even deeper. He gave his only one of a kind son. There is no other son like Jesus. His most prized possession is what he gave to his enemy. Actually, he gave heaven itself to his enemy whom we once were. So we see the principle. God applies the very principle here. But Jesus didn't end there. Notice this. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and unrighteous now notice here what jesus says he just says your sons if you do such and such if you do this your sons hold up <laughs> and then he ends he ends with this he ends this whole topic Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. According to the context of the situation that he's talking about, the context of his argument, he just concluded, be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But what did he start off with? Loving your enemy. So if I was to use my rational mind, I would then conclude that to be perfect as God is perfect 
is to love both my enemy and my friend the same way. Huh. Now, what example do we have of love? Because if you're going to ask me to love, the world loves a certain way, right? So the scripture has to supply the meaning of love itself, and it does. But when I read this the first time, and I, and I was taught it, people always told me that this is how God is, right? So this is God. This is not us. But then according to Jesus' example, be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So for you to say this is God but not us, there's, there's a misunderstanding there. So it says, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, and love does not brag. It is not ignorant, arrogant, and does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, and does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So if we're supposed to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, and the scripture testifies God is love, so then this is how it's supposed to be. We are patient. We are kind. We do not get jealous. We do not brag and are not arrogant. We do not act unbecomingly. We do not seek our own. We are not provoked. We do not take into account a wrong suffered. We do not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoice with the truth. We bear all things, we believe all things, we hope all things, and we endure all things. This is the standard that God has set for us to meet. But the sermon's entitled The Ridiculous Request. And I'll, and I'll go back to that. Now, John says this blatantly. So that you, because I'm, I'm, I'm a sinful man. So, you know, if I said for my own opinion, you know that there's some error in there. So let's let the word of God say it for itself. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We all agree with that. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of our spirit. Hold on. Did John just say how we can know if we are the sons and daughters of God? By this we know. So if I was to put it aside here, if I love those who love me and love and hate my enemy, and then if I love those who love me and love my enemy, I'm a child of God according to that standard. But if I am according to this standard, I'm not according to that standard. So hold on. That means that all of us in this room, if one of us can say that we hate someone, According to this, we, God does not abide in us. According to that statement, he does not abide in us because we don't have his spirit. Wow. So then, love is God dwelling in you. Anyone who is a child of God, you're not a child of God by because you, your name's on the church records. You're not a child of God because you come to church. You're a child of God because the love of God is in you. That is the standard and it must be met. We cannot live a moment of our lives without that standard in us. Every fight, every argument must be put away from us. For if the love of God is not in us, according to this, not my words, but the word of God, we are not his. So if we're not his, then whose are we? Thou hast said. John continues. And we know and believe the love that God has to us. God is love. 
and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him that's pretty plain I don't I don't even need to say anything then the next next one we love because he first loved us if someone says I love God and hates his brother he is a For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. The word of the Lord has said it. And so John ends the chapter with this statement. And the commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now, the, now let, let's, let's, let's actually be more specific on this because sometimes we say brother as meaning like, oh, my brother in the faith, but it's not that. We are all in this room. We are all brothers and sisters by faith through Christ, right? But we are also all brothers and sisters by blood through Adam and Eve because through one man and one woman, we all came into the beginning. But the thing is, not, not just us in this room, everyone outside of this building follows the same conditions. Though they are not sons, and, some of them may not be sons and daughters of God by faith yet, but they are still our brothers and sisters by blood through Adam and Eve. So this means if there is anyone outside these doors or in these doors that I do not love, but I can say confidently, I hate and I am not a child of God. And it is evident that God does not abide in me. But now this is the commandment. Because John was the one that said it, right? But let's get it from our Lord himself. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Huh, interesting. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. By this standard, all men will know. So I cannot stand here and say I'm a disciple of Christ if I don't love one individual in this world. Do you understand what I'm saying here, church? Because this is powerful. If love is not in your heart, the love of God is not in your heart. When Christ comes, you will be destroyed. That's just, that's just really what it is. But it's not, it doesn't need to be fearful. I presented this sermon as a ridiculous request because when God's love does not abide in you, that's exactly what it is. It's a ridiculous request. But when God's love abides in you, it's not a ridiculous request. It's your daily life. It's the life that you live. It's an honor. It's an honor. But here's the thing. I state it as a ridiculous request because it's not a ridiculous statement about us. It's a request. It's an invitation. It's an invitation. When I became Adventist or became Christian, it was ridiculous because I did not have the love of God in me. But I was starting to. And when I studied that text and I just said, well, the Bible is plain as it reads, so I don't agree with that. And I'm not. And then when, you know, when I said, okay, I agree with it, I support it. And then I had life experiences that I tried to put it into practice. I found something in me that I could not do it. The text was screaming in my head, but I just could not do it. And I was right. I was right. But because of this, I can. Amen. Because of this, we can. This is why he died. To take all that hate, all that inability to love upon himself. And in exchange, 
give us his ability and his love to us, towards us, into ourselves. Now, how many of you have heard this word righteousness by faith or justification by faith and sanctification? You've heard those? You know, we've used those big words a lot, especially in seminary. You could tell, you yes. could, <laughs> we use them a lot. But they're so simple that we shouldn't even have a big word for them. Because this is what it is. Sanctification by faith is this. God declares you loving as he is love because of the merits of his son upon you when you believe in his son. Yes. Sanctification by faith, sanctification is this. You now are imparted that love from God into your being. Yes. The Holy Spirit, who remember it says God is love, right? Yes. So God is love and the Holy Spirit is also God, right? So the Spirit of God, where does it dwell? In us. So he's given us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is love. And then what we do, we manifest it. So when we come to the cross, that's what we're asking for. And day by day, that's what we're growing into. We're just, we're just growing in love. That's all Christianity. Believing and being considered loving as God is loving. And then day by day, becoming more and more and more into love. So if you already have love in your hearts, brethren, I encourage you and I say, grow more. Yes. And if you don't, and you know that you don't, and you're honest with yourself that you don't have that, and that's okay because I myself have struggled with that. Just go to the cross. Just go to the cross and give him. Because when he died, he bought your hatred. Your sin. Remember what we said in the scripture reading? If any man does not love his brother, he abideth in death. Hold on. Wait, I thought sin brought death. What did the scripture just call sin? Failing to love one another. The Ten Commandments, Jesus summed them up. Love the Lord that God with all your strength, with all your heart, and with all your mind. And the second, love one another as yourself. So if we were to take those two, it's thou shalt love selflessly, right? Because there's no love to, one, to oneself in there. It's just love to your fellow man as, as, as you love yourself, right? So thou shalt love selflessly. So the Ten Commandments can be summed up as thou shalt love selflessly. So it's love. So when man broke the command of God, he stopped loving God. And he stopped loving his fellow man. Yeah. So now this is it. This is what he's trying to do. He's just been trying to bring us back to that standard. We can't do it of ourselves. We can't. But when we come to the cross, he will give us his self-sacrificing love. And it will sanctify our hearts. It will change our hearts. So church, I do what Moses did. I do what Jesus said. Behold the Lamb of God that takes the sins of the world and fulfill his request. That sounds ridiculous at first, but it's joy and delight, and this is it. Be like me. Thank you.
Dear kind and merciful Father, Lord, I lift up your youth and the adult to you, Lord. Please take our sin, our hatred of each other, our loathing of each other, our arguments, our fights, our, our evil thoughts, our selfish thoughts towards one another. Take our sins, Lord, as you came to die for them and give us your love in its place. Give us your righteousness and your spirit. Dwell yes. in us, Lord, richly, that as we go from, from this service, hearing this message that you want us to know and understand, please bless us to manifest this love and to grow brighter and brighter, yes. bright as the sun. In your name I pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.